Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all again, and welcome. We've been in a study of the book of Daniel for some time, and when Pastor Glenn comes back, by the way, he's doing a little bit better this morning. Mickey told me, so we keep praying for him. When he comes back, he'll finish that book. In the interim, we've been thinking about how the New Testament writers and Christ himself in particular understood Daniel's prophecies and especially the one of the return of the Son of Man, who is Christ Jesus himself. We've looked at it from several different perspectives. This morning, we're going to look at it from the perspective of the Day of Judgment. Now, this is not an easy topic to preach on. Uh, It's one most preachers avoid. We want to talk about heaven. We don't want to talk about hell too much, but Jesus does, so we need to think about it. It's a fairly difficult passage to understand as well. It's misunderstood a lot. But let's take a look this morning at Matthew chapter 25. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to that. In your pew Bible, I think you'll find that on page 831. So Jesus writes these words, or spoke these words. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? The king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? He'll answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Father in heaven, we would ask now in the strong name of Jesus that you would give us a picture of this serious event at the end of the days that we would understand where we stand with Christ and we know what we need to do. We ask it in his name, the Son of Man himself, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to take a look at something for a minute. Take a look at that. Just stare at that for a minute. What do you see? What do you see? Looks like the circles are moving, doesn't it? It does to me. And they may even be moving in different directions. That's what it appears to be. But it's not. That's just a drawing. It's just a piece of clip art. It's an optical illusion. Something that's not what it appears to be. And I put that up because I think that's the way we often think about the Bible. We read the Bible and what appears to be very clear to us may not be as clear as we think. And this passage in Matthew is one of those. And its importance couldn't be greater. Now, it's one thing for your eyes to play tricks on your mind. It's a whole other thing to miss the truth of the gospel and of salvation in Christ alone. So here we see another facet of the fulfillment of the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And this scene couldn't be more sober. It couldn't be more serious. So here we have Christ, the Son of Man, seated on a throne. And he's not only wearing the crown of the one true king, but he is holding the gavel, the gavel of the one true and righteous judge of all. 
And the Bible tells us all the nations are brought before him, and that includes you, and it includes me. And he separates them. The sheep are those who followed him on the right. The right hand of God is a place of honor. The goats are those who have not followed him to the left. The left hand of the Father is a place of dismissal. The doors of heaven and hell are opened. The evidence is presented that will determine every single person's eternal destiny. Can you see then... How because Jesus Christ is the final judge, we have to know where we stand with him. But how do we know? We know by whether or not we have received the message of Christ alone for our salvation as it has been sent to us through his messengers. And this message, I think, will surprise both those who know him and those who don't know him but should. So that's what I want us to think about for a little bit this morning. First, a surprising message for those who follow Jesus. Now you know everywhere that Christ went, his disciples were always with him, and he was always teaching them, instructing them. And here he gives them a picture and gives us a picture of the end times and the promise of eternal life for those who follow him. Then he tells them why. Because I was hungry and thirsty and I was a stranger. I was naked and sick and in prison and you came, you visited me, you ministered to me, you provided for me. Now his followers are surprised because they don't remember doing these things. They ask him, when did we do these things, Lord? And he says to them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. But this little phrase, the least of these, my brothers, is the key to understanding this passage and understanding where we stand with Jesus. But who is Jesus talking about when he says this? I think the answer may surprise many of us, maybe most of us. Now, the most common understanding of of this passage and this saying, the least of these, my brothers, focuses on the least of these. In other words, Jesus is speaking about the poor and the needy and the suffering in general. I mean, that makes sense, right? Or does it? There are two problems with that understanding. The first is simply this. Nowhere in Scripture, not one place, does Jesus call the general mass of poor and needy people his brothers. But remember something else, too. This passage is about salvation. It's about eternal life. So the second problem is nowhere in Scripture is caring for the hungry, the thirsty, the homeless, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned the measuring stick for salvation. That would make this passage a social gospel. It can't be that. You see... We won't be judged by our response to human need. It has to be something else. See, the focus is not on the least of these. The focus here is on these, my brothers. Jesus' brothers are his disciples and, by extension, everyone who follows him. Now, I'm convinced of this for several reasons. One, the normal and literal meaning of the word brothers is always either a blood relative or someone of the same religious community. This word's used 343 times in the New Testament, and every single one of those instances is one of those two things. But we also need to remember something. Jesus made this clear in Mark chapter 3 and 35. He says, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother. Now remember, the Bible always has to interpret the Bible. This is the only instance where this phrase is used. So if we don't understand a a specific passage, a specific thing in the Bible, we have to study the surrounding text, the whole book. We have to look at other places in the Bible where this is spoken of and taught. So where else do we find hungry, thirsty, homeless, naked, sick, and imprisoned brothers? Where do we find it? Well, we see the beginning of it when Jesus called his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Look at what he tells them. Go with no money, no food, no drink, no extra clothing, no place to stay. He says you're going to face sickness and imprisonment. 
See, Jesus is preparing them for the way of life that they're going to live. We see it in the Apostle Paul for sure. In prison, beaten, lashed, stoned, shipwrecked, constant danger, under toil and hardship, sleepless, hunger, thirsty, cold, and facing exposure. Certainly was a way of life for Paul. But it was clearly exemplified in Christ whose entire life was lived like that. And that's why Jesus said, as we read in our call to worship, as the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. You see, Jesus' brothers are always his followers, and his followers are always his messengers. Now, why is it critical that we get this? Well, first and foremost, it's how a person is saved. If you're a Christian here this morning, someone somewhere shared the gospel with you and you listened. And in doing so, you received them as messengers of Jesus Christ. And when you did that, the Holy Spirit began to work in your heart, showing you your need for Jesus and showing him to you as your Savior. And he gave you faith to believe and you became a follower. And you became a messenger and then the pattern repeats itself again and again and again until Christ returns. So his brothers are his followers, messengers sent to proclaim the gospel truth that salvation is found in Christ alone. And a person's salvation is dependent upon their response to that proclamation. And that proclamation from that messenger will always require suffering. You see, as people respond to Christ's followers' message, and when they align themselves with the distress and suffering of the messenger, they align themselves with Christ himself. There's no other way to understand this gospel, this message. Anything else makes this a social gospel. But there's another issue here that we don't want to miss in this passage. And that's how Christians treat other Christians gives evidence that we are his followers. Uh, I'm off on, my, my normal day off is Mondays, most of you know that. So I come in on Tuesday mornings with a lot to do. And when I'm preaching, Tuesday morning is a day I really want to get started on the scripture that I'm going to be preaching or teaching on. I spend a lot of time reading it, praying over it, trying to get an understanding of what God is doing through it. Trying to get an outline for it. Tuesday's a really important day of study for me among a lot of other things. Well, this Tuesday, I came in as normal. I was going to work on my sermon. No sooner than I finished time praying, I sat down, I started to work. I got a phone call on my cell. A dear brother who I know struggling, my heart was saying, I don't have time to talk to him. I got to work on a sermon about loving Christians. <laughs> yeah, I know it's absurd. I know it's funny. I took the call. And I was able to minister and pray to this brother. I finished up the call. It took a long time. I had another call. I mean immediately after that. Same thing. Lord, I don't have time to talk to this man. i got to write a sermon about loving Christians. Took the call. Spent some time. This happened all day long. All day long. Morning, a man came in. He needed help. Said he was a brother. Helped him. After lunch, same thing. I did not do one drop of work on a sermon on Tuesday. Not a drop. And I'm sitting there praying at the end of the day, and I'm saying, Lord, I feel so behind. I'm never going to get this thing done. This is a hard passage. And the Lord said to me, Bill, do you not see? I'm giving you an opportunity to put your money where your mouth is. This is what you're preaching about, man. Surely you see that. But no, I really didn't. Till the Lord, I'm not, I'm not that smart, y'all. I'm a bit slow, honestly. I, no heckling. He knows me. What do we do with all that? I, I know you're laughing at me, but you're probably laughing at yourself too. What do we do with all this? 
Well, I think for one thing, we have to examine our life and our faith, and we have to ask some hard questions. Let me throw a few questions out here. Am I willing to truly suffer as a follower and a messenger of gospel truth? Will I exchange my comfort and my security for a life of being mistreated or a time of being mistreated, to be hungry, to be naked, to be sick, homeless, or in prison? Am I willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel? I mean, that's what Christ did for me. Am I willing to let other followers care for me when I'm suffering? Again, the Lord gave me a real life lesson in this. This week I was struggling. And I get a call from a brother. I had no idea what he wanted. I didn't have time to talk to him. I'm working on a sermon about how to love Christians. But I knew he wouldn't call me unless something was on his mind. So I took his call. He knew I was struggling. He called just to encourage me, to pray with me, to t just, it was the best thing that I could have happened. But in my busyness, I didn't want to take his call. I didn't want somebody else to minister to me. We always think we're going to be a bother, right? We don't want to, we don't want to bother people, put him out. Am I taking the time to respond to the needs of another Christian when I see it or when I know about their suffering? This is going to require me to put aside my agenda for their needs. And one of the things really interesting about this passage is that Jesus' followers had to ask him, when did we do these things, Lord? We don't remember. Why did they not remember? Because serving other Christians had become second nature to them. I mean, is serving other Christians second nature to us, or is that a chore? How about instead of turning a blind eye, how about we turn loose of some compassion? Turn loose of a little time. You know what I've discovered this week in particular? Love will always be sacrificed on the altar of busyness and indifference. Am I treating Christian workers who I know are suffering for the cause of Christ with special honor, praying for them, opening my wallet, my resources, even my home for them? And how about this? Am I seeing other Christians as Jesus sees them? I think so often we look down at other Christians because they don't have the right theology, right? Or they don't have the right methodology. Or they don't have the same passion for the same ministry that I have. Therefore, they must be lacking in some way. Or they're not zealous enough or they're too zealous. That just flies in the face of what Jesus is teaching here. For followers of Jesus, the surprising message here is not about the nature of the gospel. It's about our response to the gospel. It's about testing our faith to see if it's real. It's about what a full embrace of the gospel looks like if it's going to be authentic in our lives. If we claim to be followers of Jesus, this passage demands that we hold our lives up to the light of biblical examination. Remember something. It's not them out there who are the least of these, my brothers. It's us. That's us. What if we really begin to live like that? What if we really begin to embrace our salvation with such joy and then reaffirm and commit ourselves as gospel messengers proclaiming Christ to the lost and found, found alike? What might the Lord do with that? Now, I think it's really important that I say something at this point. Now, while the least of these, my brothers, that Jesus refers to in this passage does not refer to the poor and needy in general, in no way does it relieve us of the biblical mandate to care for the poor and the needy and the suffering. Biblical mercy and justice and compassion runs from one cover of this Bible to the other, because that's God's heart. And that's why he said, the prophet said, Oh man, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To love mercy. 
and to walk humbly with your Lord. Not only is this a picture of God's heart, caring for broken and needy and suffering people is one of the primary means that God uses to draw people to himself. You see, this passage gives us a kind of a 30,000 foot view of all the opportunities and the responsibilities that we have as God's people. Now we said, wherever Jesus went, he was always followed by his disciples, but he was also always followed by huge crowds. And so whenever he taught, his message was always designed for both, his disciples and the larger crowd. So we looked at what he was saying to his disciples, but now we need to look at the surprising message he has for those who don't follow him but should. Now, Here's what he starts. He starts with this very frightening statement. Jesus has now moved his focus off the disciples and to the bigger crowd. And he says, to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then he presents the evidence against them. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick and in prison, and you did not come and minister to me. You did not come and care for me. You did not come and provide for me. You see, the sin of omission is just as deadly as the sin of commission. Now, they too are surprised. This group is also surprised. But what's interesting to me is they're not surprised that Jesus has just cast unbelievers into the eternal fire. I think if they were, they would start arguing with him at this point. But they don't. They're surprised at why they're being cast away. And that's what they say. Lord, when did we see you? Hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked or sick in prison. And not do these things. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now I realize Jesus doesn't use the words, my brothers here, but he doesn't have to. He just did that. He just said that. I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that when he, make, when he says these words, he's pointing to his disciples. As you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. Now, in that crowd, there are two kinds of folks that don't follow Jesus but should. There are those who think they're saved, but they're not. And then there are those who don't think they need to be saved. The first group is the religious folks. These folks would have gone to the temple, they would have prayed, they would have read the Bible, they would have given their tithes, they would have made the right sacrifices. You see, they believed their salvation was based on their religious activity. They were okay with God, they thought. But they weren't because they hadn't surrendered their hearts to Jesus Christ. And then there were the others who didn't think they needed salvation, certainly not from Jesus. I mean, there's no question, they thought Jesus was cool. He was a good teacher. I mean, he was definitely entertain, entertaining. He did these sick miracles, and everybody wanted to see those, right? But Savior, nah. I mean, they were pretty good people. Surely God agreed with them. They were doing okay by themselves, thank you very much. But Jesus tells them both very clearly, they're going to be cast away into eternal punishment because those who have no regard for the king will be indifferent to those who are carrying the message about the king. And in doing that, they reject the king himself. As much as we wished he would do this, he doesn't. Jesus does not. He does not use skywriting to make his message known. He makes it known through his followers, his messengers. And so if you reject the messenger, you reject Jesus, and you reject your only hope for salvation. Now, you may be here this morning, and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, or maybe you don't know exactly where you stand with him. I'm glad you're with us. I truly am. I was that way for a long time. I've said it many times. But maybe as you've listened to me talk this morning, you see yourself as one of these two groups. Maybe... Maybe you see yourself as okay with God because you're religious. You go to church, you read your Bible, you pray, 
You put money in the offering plate. Maybe you even serve. And those are good things. But not one of them will save you. Not one of them. Or maybe you're somebody here this morning that think you're okay with God. I don't really need a Savior. I'm doing pretty good. I'm a pretty good person. I want to tell you something. These are the illusions of all illusions. It's one thing for your eyes to play tricks on your mind. It's another thing altogether to miss gospel truth. I am Jesus' messenger to you this morning. I am proclaiming grace and truth to you. I am proclaiming that Christ alone is your only hope for salvation. I'm proclaiming if you are not a follower of Jesus, you should be. J.C. Ryle was a great British theologian and pastor. He once said, with the same heart men die, with that heart they will rise again. If you pass away having rejected Jesus, you will rise rejected by Jesus. Eternally separated from his grace, from his constraining goodness of evil. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know it. The Bible says for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. To call upon the name of the Lord simply means to confess that we're sinners. That we're in need of salvation and we can't save ourselves. It's to ask God for forgiveness and ask him to come into our hearts. It's to receive him by faith and then surrender our hearts and our lives to him. And the Bible says when you do that, You move from the left hand of the Father, the place of dismissal, to the right hand of the Father, which is the place of honor. That's the promise that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we finish up this morning, let me just say a couple of things. This passage dispels two really foolish notions. One, it dispels the foolish notion that there's not a hell. There is, but no one, no one has to go there. But it also dispels the foolish notion that Jesus was just a good man or a good teacher or a good leader. This passage presents him clearly as the one true king and judge, the one with divine authority before whom every human being will stand and give an account of their lives. And it won't be our words that give evidence to faith. It will be our lives that testify for us or against us. And this one thing, have I received the gospel message that Jesus Christ alone is Lord and, found, and salvation is found in him and no one else? Because Jesus Christ is the final judge, we have to know where we stand with him. And you can know. The word is clear. So here's our assignment. This is a month of prayer. I'm asking you to pray. I've written this prayer. And maybe you can join me in praying this. Jesus, stir up in me a heart that's willing to suffer, to proclaim your message of grace to the lost and found alike, and then give me opportunities to do that. And I believe as we will, God will honor that. And he will work with great power and great might. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, you would not have put this in your word unless it was critical. Christ Jesus wouldn't have spoken these words unless he was absolutely convinced that we had to know where we stand with him. I think too often we think we're okay when we're not. But Lord, you tell us what is the evidence. It's that we have received the gospel and we have become messengers of that same gospel and that we're willing to suffer. Lord, recommit our hearts to these truths. And Lord, if there's one here this morning who doesn't know you and wonders, they can know you. Speak grace and truth into their hearts. Give them the first opportunity today to cry out to you knowing you will hear and you will answer. It's what you do. So bless these words to our hearts. Change us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.